This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you by the Swords Shirt, which proclaims the truth that every sword enthusiast knows down to their core that swords are awesome. Why? Because swords! That's why. Available through Teespring. Link in the description. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and welcome to Pop Culture Weapons Analyzed. And yeah, I'm naming the series because I seem to do it fairly often these days, where if it's Captain America's shield, Wolverine's claws, stuff like that, just fun to see pop culture interpretations of weapons and armor, how they're employing it in their stories and stuff, and see how accurate and realistic it really is. So in this episode, we'll be looking at Goblin Slayer. Now, Goblin Slayer is an anime which, in my previous episode on the subject, I mentioned it was adapted from a manga when, when in actual fact the manga was adapted from a light novel. So there you go. It's rather a controversial subject if you're not aware of it, but if you're familiar with my content, you already know the ins and outs. But if you haven't seen my content, I've already made a whole video addressing the controversy of Goblin Slayer, which then frees me up to make a video like this without people bringing it up. So if you're going to bring it up, please go check out my video to hear my thoughts on that subject. But in this one, no, I want to focus on Goblin Slayer's weapons, armors, and tactics, because in regards to the tactics, some of the more inventive and enjoyable parts of the Goblin Slayer anime, net manga, or whatever you want to enjoy, novel, like, novel stuff. Just to preface this as well, I'm a medieval enthusiast, okay? I love studying weapons and armor, how they were actually used and stuff like that, and so that's my knowledge base in applying it to fiction, seeing how realistic and effective they really would be. So, we'll start with looking at Goblin Slayer's armor. I like that he is fully armoured, okay, head to toe, that, that's good protection. As to the design, we can clearly see this is very fantasy-esque inspired. There is not much authentic historical functional design here. Oh, ah, sorry, I'll take the functional back. There is, uh, there is quite a bit of functionality in the design, but not historical design. But there's also some flaws in that functionality as well, which is why I was going to say it doesn't have any function, because uh, there are some interesting elements. Okay, so he's got a fairly good full helmet, but his visor is placed inside the helmet underneath. I've never seen this done historically. One of the reasons why, with how this visor is attached, Technically, it would be impossible for him to raise it. Of course, he never raises it in the anime or manga at all. In fact, that's one of the kind of running gags and jokes. He has like this small little lip thing he can open up so he can drink and eat uh, with his visor still down. He never raises it and you never see his face. But that's really a trope kind of gag. I think it's implied that you can raise the visor where in actual fact, this would be really difficult. Like if the visor was sitting on the inside of the helmet and there was nothing else kind of cushioning it, when you try and raise it, it would get caught on your hair, drag around, get jammed and just wouldn't really work. As to how well he would be able to see from it, that's fine actually. In fact, you'd probably be able to see out of visor with vertical, you know, openings much better than the type of historical helmets that only have these small little slits. One of the reasons why they have small little slits on historical helmets is so it's very hard for blades to kind of get in and, you know, kill you. Still, we see helmets that are just open-faced and, and are far more vulnerable than Goblin Slayer's one. So it's not a point of criticism. I'm just sharing what some of the historical references are so you, you know a bit more on the subject. Look at that, using pop culture to educate people on medieval history. My plot has been uncovered. There are clearly horns attached to his helmet at some point which have been broken off. Good, they would just get in the way and they're annoying. Rarely were horns ever actually put on historical helmets. And the Vikings did not have them. Okay, what about the rest of his armor? It's interesting. Essentially, it is male, chain mail, with metal plates over top. This was done historically. In more of the transitional period between mail and plate, we see bits of, you know, plate being added to the mail bit by bit. And it can start with pauldrons, metal braces and stuff like that to full kind of arm bits, a gorget around the lower part of the neck and maybe a bevor to cover the chin. But as to plates that are actually attached to the chest part, there are less instances of plate being put over mail. You see, if you have a, a, a layer of padding and then a layer of mail and then a big hunking plate on top of it, that's almost overkill, okay? It's very difficult to pierce plate. When more full plate comes in, the, there are vulnerable parts because the plate doesn't cover everything. One of the most vulnerable parts is right under the armpit here because you need to be able to be maneuverable. You have the pauldron there, but generally nothing underneath. So what do they have to cover there? Well, they need something flexible and it would generally be mail. People have interpreted that to think that pe people in full plate armor always wore a full male shirt underneath. Let me introduce you to a thing called the arming doublet. What do you see here? Male is attached to kind of a cloth gambeson type.
light garment in only those areas where it would be exposed under the plate. All the areas where there is just plate protecting, there's no need to have mail there at all. So they just had padded garment. This reduces the weight but gives just as much protection. Which makes logical sense. You see, people in the past, they weren't dumb. They thought about these things and they had some really inventive and almost ingenious ways of putting things together in the most optimal fashion possible. I don't think we see this with Goblin Slayer. In fact, his plates are just strapped right over on top of his mail. There's another bit of a weakness in Goblin Slayer's design, and it's that his chest plate is actually made out of three separate pieces. Why is this uh, a bad design? Well, it means that it's possible that thrust could get right in between one of these gaps and then slide up and get right, you know, well, it hit his mail because he has mail under there. So maybe that's why he has mail because there's possible ways to get through the plate. But mail is much easier to get through than plate and there's a chance that he could just be run straight through into his heart. Not a good thing. It would have been much better if the front plate was just a solid plate, which is what armor eventually evolved into. And I'm not saying there wasn't, you know, separate plates done on historical armors. They were. A good example of this is the code of plates where, you know, metalworking technology was not as, as sophisticated enough to interlock them in such a beautiful way like we see on full plate. So what they did, they actually just kind of riveted the plates onto either a leather or cloth linen, you know, facing. And that would hold the metal plates in place. But because of that, there were sometimes gaps in between. They would try and overlap the plates, but still you can get something in between right through the gaps, slide up and it would hit you. But of course, armor didn't stay like that forever. It evolved and when we get to the full plate, what do we see on breastplates? These full kind of sheets plate single all right and then they're also domed in a way to deflect uh, strikes going away which would uh, reduce a lot of the energy just being impacted into the steel so there are some flaws and impracticality about goblin slayer's design yet overall it's still very protective okay so i do give it a thumbs up in that regard and it's actually great that in goblin slayer we see the armor having an effect where a goblin comes down and stabs him right and you'd generally be a vulnerable part for anyone right but with proper armor does nothing Good to see. What about Goblin Slayer's weapons? Well, this is the interesting thing because Goblin Slayer, he doesn't really have a set weapons. His actual main tactic is to just start off with a fairly standard weapon, which seems to be a short sword and small shield, which I would call a Taj. The reason behind it is that Taj is the closest approximate to what Goblin Slayer has, a small shield that's strapped onto the arm, but still has a lot, enough kind of versatility to keep the hand open and grab things. A Rotella is usually bigger than that and usually don't. His one is particularly small and it's not a buckler, okay? A buckler is held in the center and is about yay big. I have a whole video on the most iconic swords from history, which you can go check out if you like. And I go through all those ones. You'll hear me mention Taj, Buckler, Rotella, Viking Round, Kite, Heater, Hoplon, Scutum, they're all there and good information. All right, so the methodology of Goblin Slayer picking up his enemy's weapons as he goes. I never really understood this. Admittedly, I've only read the manga further on in regard to the anime. I've only seen the first episode. But in the manga, he mentions that there's no point in using really fancy swords, even like he, he, put, he turns down using mithril, magical enchanted swords because goblin blood ruins them. Now, if that is an in-world explanation where goblin blood is really greasy and gunky and like gets stuck on the blade in clumps, making them less effective, well then of course that would make sense. Weapons basically get more and more useless the more you use them against goblins. And so he just throws away and picks up the next one, which if there is a proper in-world explanation like that, okay, I can accept it. Still, I really do think there should be a logical solution to that problem. Like, I don't know, oiling the blade better and so blood and fat doesn't stick to it as much. And this is a fantasy setting, remember? And so if just mundane techniques don't work, I'm sure there could be some magical spell something somewhere that would solve this problem and enable Goblin Slayer to use an actual reliable effective weapon without having to ditch them all the time. But okay, so those are my thoughts on here, the fact that he just picks up weapons as he goes. What about the weapons that he usually starts with as his more standardized set? The little shield and short sword. Not really a fan. He doesn't need the shield. He's fully armored. You know, one of the reasons why shields kind of went out of practice is because people were wearing full plate armor. If you're wearing full plate armor, there is far less need to wear a shield. Ah, but Shad, there are some instances where knights in full plate armor are holding a shield, specifically the classic heater shield. Why are they doing that? 
Well, there are some attacks in the medieval repertoire that can threaten someone in armor. Maces, war hammers, and pole axes and the like, well, they're kind of made to hurt people in armor, so they're still a worry. And so for the off chance where you might be facing against weapons that still can hurt you in armor, that's when you want to shield with your armor. And the heater shield was kind of the go-to knightly shield in that instance. But more often than not, the goblins are weaker than humans, unless it's fighting the hobgoblins and larger ones. And so if you is he's gonna fight the larger ones, okay, yes, he might want a shield in that instance, and he would definitely want a bigger shield than this prissy little Taj that he's carrying around, especially against like the goblin, the larger goblins you see in this series. Yeah, at least a heater shield, if not a kite shield, to protect against their big clubs and larger weapons that you might run into. But against the little goblins, no point in using a shield at all. Uh, but what about maneuverability? Because that's one of the issues. Goblins are most often in caves. Caves, very, there's not a lot of room to swing a sword around. I'm not fully convinced about this. This is very much a role-playing trope. I actually think it's even mentioned in one of the D&D manuals regarding larger weapons with reach and that if you're in a situation where uh, you're like have less room to move around, if you only have that five foot square to move and you have a weapon that has 10 foot reach, I think the rules even say you can't use them in those instances. Okay, you're in a cave, all right? Granted, there might not be much room on either side, even over top, but there's generally plenty of room in front and plenty of room behind, okay? And swords don't need to be swung to use effectively. They're also really good at stabbing things. And even in confined circumstances, yeah, you can stab really effectively. And anyone with a brain would know to use this weapon in the correct way in confined circumstances. We see that in Goblin Slayer 1, there is a adventurer who uses his sword in the incorrect way and he hits the roof of a cave and, get, and disarms himself and then is brutally bashed and eaten alive. Yet still, even in a cave, using something with reach can still be very advantageous, okay? And if you have a sword, keeping a guard out in front, stabbing everyone, uh, heck, even a spear, can still be effective in this circumstance. And then if you come into a situation where the cave opens up, which oftentimes does in these settings, well, we can use it in a conventional way. So I don't think the logic of no long swords or even spears allowed in caves is actually fully reasoned out. I'm not saying there might not be situations where it becomes less awkward, but that's why you carry a backup weapon, and your backup weapon would probably be something shorter. But a fairly universal law in like medieval combat and stuff is that reach is really, really good. And if you're in a situation where you can use reach, you use it if you can. And so the idea that it's just thrown away because of caves, meh, not so much. So Goblin Slayer only using smallish weapons, I think it's just playing along with that role-playing trope. But that's actually one of the reasons why I love Goblin Slayer. It's basically role-playing, a full-on D&D game exported into an actual story we can watch. And one of the things that I appreciate most is that it is Goblin Slayer has the most faithful conversion of the role-playing magic system that I have ever seen. And I've enjoyed stories based on role-playing, like Dragonlance, which is basically Dungeons and Dragons in a fantasy, you know, novel and stuff. I've also watched Record of Lodos Wars, another anime so inspired by classic D&D-like fantasy. And the magic is just kind of converted into a general, normal, magic-ish kind of system. Dragonlance is a bit more faithful to classic D&D, but Goblin Slayer even more so, where you specifically, you only have three spells per day, and that, that's it, if you have three spells. But he asks how many spells you have, two or three, or something and oh I've just gotten my third spell and stuff and the interesting thing about this the imagine I'm getting off topic from weapons armor but this is cool right just, just, just humor me for now quickly is this magic system is really actually effective for a story because it has good limitations and you know the rules a good magic system is one with rules Brandon Sanderson Mistborn ah, Mistborn is the hardcover. Even though other authors have understood this, he is kind of the first one that has really defined it in specific terms with his classic Sanderson Laws of Magic. And he mentions that, you know, have, have, giving a magic system rules can be very effective because your ability to resolve conflicts and plots in a story in a satisfying manner is directly proportional to how well the audience understands how that magic system works. And so if you have proper defined rules, it can work really well. And this is exactly what they do in Goblin Slayer because we know exactly what spells Priestess has and we know how many she has. And so Goblin Slayer tells her to save them for the right situation and stuff like that. And so what I'm saying here is that there are certain elements of Goblin Slayer in which it's faithful, you know, translation of classic role-playing tropes and even rules works really well and uh, complements the story as the idea of any 
long-ish kind of weapon or just even medium-sized weapon like a standard army sword and long sword not being used in caves that's a trope that people really haven't questioned properly in my opinion what would be the best weapon for goblin slayer because you know i've criticized and analyzed what he is using what would i think he should use well this is interesting because this is a a, a cool situation weapons are all about context okay there is no one weapon that is universally better than all other weapons there's no one sword that is uni universally better than all other swords okay unless you could make one out of a super material or something like that anyway, we won't get into that all right it's all about circumstance situation and context go away matt easton now the interesting thing the uh, more common circumstance for medieval warfare is a situation in which the sword does not fare too well if you're fighting against people in heavy armor okay on a battlefield sword it's not going to be your first pick not by far all right a good old pole arm generally and i mean if you're not on range or on horseback but yeah good old pole arm or then an axe and if it's people in armor yeah a mace or war hammer you know the situations where swords are really effective is in personal self-defense or if you're fighting people who are unarmored the goblins in goblin say are mostly unarmored there are situations where they are wearing some measures of armor but that's usually only a breastplate the heads are still generally mostly vulnerable this is a situation where the sword mwah, it fits really well, but not just any sword. We're looking at a big choppy sword, okay? And so people are like, ah, oh, katana is good and choppy. And you know, yes it is. The katana doesn't have nearly as good reach as other swords, not a good handguard, but it's a great cutter. And for an adventurer who is less trained and stuff, it's probably even a better pick. But if you're trained in knowing how to get good edge lime and things like that, having a sword with greater reach would probably be even better. And so we're looking at a long sword with a hefty kind of blade, but if you really want to focus on cutting and you're not as uh, you know focused on the advantages of having a back edge a back edge is really useful in jewels and stuff like that it gives you a faster quicker more versatility and types of moves you can use it might not be as necessary in goblins where you just want to chop 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 so that means something with a single edged but two-handed so we're looking like a messer or two-handed falchion yeah baby you can get ones that have great thrusting ability and their cutting ability and the other reason why this is really advantageous is the goblins are not wearing armor which in most instances they're not okay a big wide swing when you have the room and even in the caves it looks like there are situations because like even a guy okay that gets killed he is he does several swings and is hitting the goblins okay there's only one instance where he wasn't paying attention he hits the roof so clearly you can swing even in goblin slayer world caves okay and so if you can do that do a big swing and you have a really cut centric sword you'll be able to kill more than one goblin in a big swing you kill several these guys are little they're unarmored just don't get outnumbered and don't be a girl I mean, seriously, if you're in the Goblin Slayer universe, females would probably never, ever try and fight goblins just for that possibility in which you might get overrun. But having said that, I mean, for a guy who's fighting goblins, if they get overrun, they get killed. So that's dumb. What I just said was dumb. Clearly, there are horrible results if you try and take on goblins and you get overrun, whether you're a male or a female in this instance. Unless there was a setting kind of element in which makes the goblins even far worse, which I mentioned in my other video, it gets dark. And if that's the case, yeah, maybe female adventurers would be even more reluctant to take on goblins than just guys, because there is a fate worse than death. Well, their fate is death, and it's worse. It's a really bad kind of death. Like I said, it's dark. But like I was saying before, a cut-centric sword is a great pick for taking on goblins. Something with a good, you know, amount of leverage, so two-handed, and even if you're in a situation where you're in confined spaces, you can still thrust with the thing, and if you're in a situation where it's just impractical and there's too many, well, guess what? A short sword is short, so carry it as a backup. And so the fact that Goblin Slayer is never employing a, a larger weapon that's more effective in taking out small unarmored opponents where you can kill several and several strikes is a bit illogical in my mind. If you were to look at it from an actual, you know, practical perspective from an understanding of real weapons and armor. Okay, what about his tactics? And that's really where Goblin Slayer shines the most because He's a bit of a tactician, this guy. He thinks outside of the box. And this is one of the things I love about the whole series. It's probably my favorite part. Are the clever tactics he uses, specifically using already established RPG mechanics and tropes. Thinking outside the box, it's fun. And there's so many opportunities for this with classic role-playing game mechanics. And this is what Goblin Slayer does. I won't spoil things, but he uses like spells. Like for instance, he uses a gate spell, which basically opens up a portal somewhere 
in such a cool way, which is just great. And then he does something like this again later on, different tactic, where there is a, uh, a mirror, a portal mirror, and he gets some, it's, it's cool, okay? That's great, no criticisms at all there. Like I said, best parts about Goblin Slayer are his tactics. Awesome. And then of course there are his other tactics of fighting goblins like wiping feces all over himself and priestess. So the goblins can't smell them, using priestess's spells in the right way that she can use light and uh, like uh, protection which just creates a barrier in cool inventive ways. Setting up trip ropes and things like that. Yeah, awesome. But there we go, these have been my thoughts and reviews of Goblin Slayer's weapons, armor, and tactics. I hope you've enjoyed, and of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, farewell.